I aim to contribute to the discussion of the nature of the archive we create by doing archaeology. I will argue that the archive we produce and use in our practice reveals a relationship between the sense of truth and the sense of justice with which we make ourselves archaeologists and try to act within the limits and possibilities of being archaeologists. In order to do so, I will, uh, I will focus on how Jacques Derrida conceived the notion of archive as an arena in the struggle between different physiological, historical, ontological, and nomological forces. And then I will discuss Kevin Lucas' idea of archive practice in archaeology as being a natural translation process, emphasizing that such a process is a dialogue between epistemology and ethics. But before that, I will start with the distinction outlined by the anthropologist Dan Stoller between the archive for historians and the archive for cultural theorists. As you will see, it will be useful because it enables a cartography where we can place the discussion of archaeological archive practice. And Stoller, in her book Along the Archival Brain, Epistemic Anxieties and Colonial Common Sense, discussed the nature of the archival research, highlighting the following distinction. One could argue that the archive for historians and the archive for cultural theorists had been wholly different analytical objects. For the former, a body of documents and the institutions that house them. And for the latter, a metaphoric invocation for any corpus of selective collections and the loggings that the acquisitive quest for primary, originary, and untouched and touched. End of quotation. Even if this distinction makes sense from an analytical point of view, Stoller uh, draws our attention to how it is mainly an organization of studies which in fact merge both perspectives, crossing bodies of documents with different metaphors in order to create uh, critical perspectives about the nature of archives and about the knowledge which might be produced through archives. Regarding the intertwining of these two ways of addressing the archive, Marlene Manoff, coming from an information studies perspective, points out the proliferation of metaphors used by different disciplines during the 1990s. Such proliferation expressed how these ways of thinking were challenging how disciplines might conceive their objects of study and thereby the traditional disciplinary boundaries categorizing such objects. Facing such proliferation, proliferation of metaphors, Stoller suggests that, my, that such studies might be called ethnography in an archival mode meaning they research a broad broader social life of archives, seeking the recognition of how the documents comes into the social arena, and how it unfolds the conditions to remake its social significance. This means that the archival, that archival research is not an extractive exercise, as if it was a linear bureaucratic matter, but the critical action towards the creation of a resistance to disciplinary imperatives, social normativity, or political tyrants. Such resistance is pursued through a re a redistribution practice towards the multiplication of the possibilities to use documents as mediators of our relationship with historical context we aim to know. In concluding the analysis of the archival term, Stoller reminds us of its long history, referring to the work of Michel Foucault and Michel Certeau. In fact, uh, Stoller highlights Michel Certeau in his book The Writing of History when discussing the historiographical operation points out how archival practice is a matter of redistribution, the act of changing something into something else, a change made through a game of mediation in which we articulate codes of recognition and systems of expectation, playing with the limits and possibilities under which we can develop our work with archives. Some of these topics were also addressed by archaeologists during the 1990s in discussing the archaeological process and social meaning of the discipline. The draft of archaeology by Shanks and McGuire is an example where the scientificity and the creativity of the archaeological process depends on how archaeologists can work with their objects of study as a matter of changing something into something else in order to open up the possibilities to engage with the past. I will return to this later with work of Gavin Lucas. Mm -hmm. But before that, let's move to um, Derrida's notions of archive. Derrida, uh, Archive Fever is a book on the nature of archive, showing it as a technical, political, juridical, and ethical place. 
a place, a place of authority within which is set the possibilities to create truth and memory. In order to discuss the dynamics of such possibilities, Derrida reminds us that the word archive is linked to the Greek word arche, highlighting two points. The first one is that the, the word arche entitles two principles. The principle of commencement, making the archive a place of physical, historical and topological origin, and the principle of commandment, making the archive a place of law or numerological origin. In this sense, the archive is not a stable place housing record of original truth, but the place of unstable forces emerging from the clash between the principles of commencement and commandment, in which the stability of truth is forged. And it's forged by taking technical, political, juridical and ethical decisions. It is with the establishment of such stability that the archive becomes an institution housing the truth about people, about the territory the, or history, acquiring the power to create a community and participate in its future. The second point that Hedar makes about the link between Arche and Archive is how the archive managed its own relationship with World Arche, saying that the concept of the archive shelters in itself, of course, this memory of the name Arche but it also shelters itself from this memory, this memory which it shelters, which comes down to saying also that it forgets it. By forgetting that key, or by forgetting the work of turning the struggle between the different principles into a stable truth, the archive can claim for itself the authority of housing the truth beyond such struggle. So, and paradoxically, the archive, as a place of record, grounds its authority in an act of erasing and forgetting the conditions in which it emerged. Thus, the work of archives, as, to work, uh, as a work uh, researching for truth, has to deal with, with these two forces. A force of preservation, in which the archive became a place of order, a place of integration, and a place of future projects and the force of destruction, in which the archive erased those elements against its own order and future. To work with these two forces, we need to be in line with the archive, in order to be able to do a cartography or, uh, of what we can know and think with, our, with, with what the force of preservation has to tell us. And with such cartography, try to formulate the misalignments needed to know and to think with what uh, has been erased. This means uh, to think and to know about what the archive turned unthinkable and unknown. In doing that, the work of archive is not just a matter of studying the lines between the past, the present and the future, but the work we, in which we may play with those lines in order to enlarge our possibilities to work within and beyond the order of archive. Or, in the words of Derrida, a work on the promises of time to come. Regarding this, Derrida writes, the archive, if you want to know what this will have meant, we will only know in the times to come, perhaps. Not tomorrow, but in the times to come, later on, or perhaps never. A spectral Christianity is up to work in the concept of the archive and ties it, like religion, like history, like science itself, to a very similar experience of the promise. I will return to this idea of promise later, in discussing the sense of truth in the work of archive and archaeology. For now, let us continue with Derrida's framing of, of the archive as an emergence between forces of preservation and destruction, because it sounds similar to the idea of archaeology as a creative act of destruction, which leads us to getting Lucas' idea of archaeology as a matter of translation practice, creating the archaeological economy. Getting Lucas suggests we look at the archaeological process as an intervention in which there is a mobilization of human, organic and inorganic agents, mediated through the relationship between the archaeological sites and their archives. The production of the archive is made of different but articulated movements, such as disaggregation and assembly, in which former unities are recombined into new entities, which we may call objects of study. Such objects create other frameworks, becoming circulating reference, expanding the network and actors participating in the archaeological economy. In this process, the sites are transformed into something else, the archive. In order to understand this transformation, Lucas suggests we take the process of archiving as a process of translation, showing how it entails the same questions as ones, as ones we can raise about the relationship between the original and the topic. We may say that the copy is a representation of the original, which means that the archive is the representation of the site. 
but such representation depends on the technical possibilities of copying, which means that we may only pick up from the original what the technical possibilities allow. If we acquire more sophisticated techniques of copying, we may contribute to a better knowledge of the original, because it may change the way we interact with it. So copying becomes a way of knowing the original. In this sense, the original and the copy are not separate entities, but entities whose knowledge, whose knowledge is shaped through a relationship of technical translation made between the original and the copy. From these, Lucas invites us to think about the mediation whereby we enlarge our possibilities of knowing the site and the archive as a process of method translation, shifting the properties of the site into the properties of another materiality, and at the same time acting upon the site according to the archive project we choose. So archive practice in archaeology is a method intervention of redistribution in which something is changed or translated into something else. In this task of translation, we work on the possibilities of the scientificity and creativity of the teaching, a work managed by a principle of objectivity. The objectivity of the method we use in the constitution of the archive, an objectivity that ensures an understanding of the materialization that has been done, and makes certain possibility of enlarging its work and knowledge. Lucas highlights how this objectivity acts as an epistemological position, in the sense that it conditions the way archaeologists use stratigraphy, typology, or technological analysis principles. But also as an epistemic virtue, allowing the construction and embodiment of disciplinary morals, which holds archaeology as a discipline. Thus, objectivity turn, turns translation and the archive into a matter of uh, duty and judgment the duty of producing archives in order to make shareable the knowledge of the sites and through this sharing contribute to the constitution of a community of archaeologists and the judgment forged by the creation of an intersubjectivity platform from which we can relate to each other's archives and expand the archaeological economy. But besides the construction of this intersubjectivity, the embodiment of objectivity as an epistemological and ethical principle also entails an intra-subjectivity, an intra-subjectivity in which there is an interaction between each archaeologist's singularity and the, dis and the discipline imperatives, an opposition where we face our limits and possibilities of being archaeologists and may transform the discipline into a more inclusive practice, and at the same time an intra-subjectivity within which our singularity as archaeologists may be the condition to understand the singularity of the sites, of sites. A singularity that resists to the techniques we use in the process of method translation and shows an irreducible element, something that we cannot translate, challenging the routine of the process of translation. And irreducible that by jolting us from the routinization of practice, make us encounter the limits and the possibilities beyond the order within the archives we produce. Once outside the routine, Objectivity shows us the link between epistemology and ethics as the aporia of translation, the paradox that empowers translation as a way to act and produce different uh, meaningful materializations as we seek uh, the irreducible, a different way of translation that may do justice to uh, such irreducible thing. To conclude, uh, the practice of archive shows us that the path between epistemology and ethics, rather than being just a matter of truth, may be comprehended as a matter of justice. It's not a matter of arguing for the truth of a matter of translation, but a matter of how it may do justice to the irreducibility, irreducibility of the site. Irreducible is not suitable for, tra for translation, and thereby for its configuration as an epistemo epistemological valid truth. Instead, it challenges translations translation to do justice to its irreducibility. Its, its truth as the shape of justice. Here the archive is not just a place to manage and extract truth, but a place where the truth is made through a sense of justice. A justice formed by the encounter between the irreducibility of archaeologists, sites and archives. A justice whose translation, rather than taking the form of an order to the archive, comes as a promise, as something to come, something that empower us to enlarge the ways we produce and work with archives and expand the archaeological economy in which we make ourselves archaeologists. That's all. Thank you.